All right, so next up is uh, Corey. He's actually a returning presenter um, oh. here. We, we, since the event is about two years old now, we have our first returning people. Uh, so no pressure. I want to see how you've grown. <laughs> nice. All right. So uh, I'm Corey Pearson. I'm the co-founder of Castora. And as we were introduced, uh, predictive analytics, near and dear to our heart. Today, um, in the presentation, I'm going to share a little bit about what that means and what is predictive analytics in retail. But also, I'm going to share a little bit about the challenges uh, that we handle every day that go beyond just the predictive algorithms. Uh, very much on point with what Vijay was just talking about, coming up with the insight is really just step one. And we have to work just as hard to get those insights into various functions and various marketing teams in order for us to find success. So I'll talk a lot about um, how to A, get the insight, and B, make it useful. Awesome. So retail today, we like the analogy of the universe because there are endless amounts of customers all over the world. And there's also, as the theme of, of this group and the night, there's an almost infinite amount of data out there right now. And customers drop that data um, through a variety of different means. So of course, customers make purchases over time. Uh, they buy different types of products. They return some of those products. They also come through different search channels. They come through different affiliate channels. When they're on the website, they look at different products. Uh, they interact with certain types of emails. Uh, they are now starting to interact with different types of social campaigns. And throughout all of this, they're dropping little bits of data that we all know as marketers um, has the potential to have a lot of value. And so it's, it's, a, it's an enormous opportunity. You know, never before, in the bricks and mortar days of the past, you didn't have that much data on the way that your, your users interacted with things. But it's also a big challenge because, and, and again, agreeing with a story I think we'll hear a lot tonight, yeah, big data is this huge opportunity, but when it's big, when it's an aggregate, when there's a lot of noise in, out there, it, it's not that actionable. And so the, the challenge is figuring out how to take all of this and distill it down, how to draw insights that you can use to grow your business, to find the types of customers you need to find, to keep your customers engaged. That's really the, the goal of a large number of vendors in the marketing analytics space today. And for us, you know, where, where Castora sits in this, we like to think of, of, of this process as kind of a, a three-step process. First is, across all of these data points, there are stories about customers. As, as an individual, if I go shopping at store X, I don't only interact with email. I don't only interact on the web. You know, you, 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 I might you know, one day come in and buy something, and the next day use a search engine to find you, and, and you know, three months later, I saw you on a social campaign, and I click in. And there's data across all of this. So the first thing is to say, you know, if we can paint pictures about customers across all these different data sources, then that's a start. Uh, we like to think of it as uh, every customer has a story, bringing, bringing the stories, the customer stories out of the data. But step two is then, and going back to our nice uh, cheesy joke that we're trying on for the first time tonight of the blender, is uh, synthesis. It's mixing that together. It's not enough just to align the data and to say, hey, we want to put it in the context of the customer. Now I want to learn something. And this is really where, in the beginning days of Castora, this is what we thought was the holy grail, was being able to say, hey, I've got all these data points together. So marketers, I can tell you, I can point to this new customer who maybe bought one or two things over their first month, and I can say, here are the products they're likely to buy. Here's how often they're going to order. Here's how much money they're going to spend. Um, and that's awesome. And, and we thought that you know, that kind of synthesis was going to take us to the promised land. And we still believe it's part of that. <laughs> but um, that, that synthesis step now is where we get into things like predictive analytics. Uh, finding that customer who used to purchase once a week who's now been quiet for a month. And that might be a sign of something to worry about. And, and looking a little differently at that person who only buys once a year around the holidays with an enormous order and not thinking that something's wrong if they're quiet for a month. You know, these are all these things that require uh, data synthesis and analysis and models and prediction, the kinds of things that traditionally are done by in-house data science teams or maybe you, know, you go hire the big consultants, the IBMs of the world to, to build some custom models. But similar problems that a lot of retailers face. 
And so step two for us is trying to use all of the new technologies out there, you know, just like Rent the Runway, we're built, we use a lot of R to do a lot of this uh, heavy lifting with statistics. But to, to take not 100% of what every company would need to do with predictive models, but to take some of these core ones, how much are people going to spend, what products are they going to like, who's going to return, who's not, and bake that into software. But what we learned is that step three, the actions, is actually just as challenging, and we spend just as much time doing that. And it's, uh, this is where I'll, I'm going to uh, walk through a couple of case studies that we have with customers that kind of walk through this from the moment of us thinking that we had it all figured out uh, in our early days because we had this great insight and this great predictive models and predictive analytics for the win forever. Um, and then realizing all of the nitty gritty things that we had to do to make those insights come to life. Um, and that's uh, one of the key lessons that we've learned so far um, as we've been growing. So. Uh, the first key insight that's near and dear to Castora is customer lifetime value. And for those of you who haven't heard of this term before, the basic description is some customers come to a brand, a store, and they might buy 10 things um, over the course of their life, you know, one year, two years. Other customers might come in and just buy one thing once and never return. And there's a difference there. The lifetime value, that total value of the 10-time buyer is obviously higher than the one-time buyer. And in order to, to calculate lifetime value, you know, if you have many, many years of history, you can look at, hey, those customers we acquired you know, five years ago, how much have they spent to date on average? No fancy data science there. That's just running some historical database queries. Look at a cohort. Uh, that's pretty simple. But when things get really interesting is when you say, well, how about those new customers we're acquiring right now, the ones that the marketing team's trying so hard to, to, to get the attention from and bring them in? We've only had them for about a month. How much are, are they going to be worth? And, and where we have this insight for this business is studying some of these great predictive models that can say, you know, if I look at what they buy, what's the product category, what's the order size? I look at the other data that we might have, have gathered on them up until that point, like what channels did they come through? Um, what stuff did they look at on the site it, on their way to making that order? All of those things with the right predictive models can, can yield these great insights about, huh, that's a customer there where this one's going to be that 10-time buyer, one of those all-stars. That one over there is not so much. And we thought, you know, we knew, we ran the models, we're predicting really well. And so step one for us, we said, this is awesome. We can bring this thing, we can, we can build a product on it, and we can talk more about that later, of, of, of you know, the interesting challenges and taking these algorithms and, and spinning up these clusters of servers to, to run them efficiently and, and get those insights out there. And we thought, hey, once we can generate customer lifetime value insights, um, all these marketing teams are going to know exactly how to use it and apply it to start making better decisions. And specifically, what we thought was that in this world of, of uh, customer acquisition, all of these marketing teams that are trying to spend money to acquire customers, we thought that they were going to be the ones who were most anxious to leverage lifetime value analysis. Because in the traditional world, and what is still in large part the case today, those marketers, they spend money on a channel. Imagine like a, a certain keyword they're spending. You know, there's a store that sells all kinds of clothes, so they're buying keywords on pants. And they're spending a certain amount of money on pants, and they're attracting some new customers who are buying pants. And the optimization of that, of how many dollars am I spending and how many dollars am I earning, was primarily just looking at the order itself. So if I spend 10 bucks, but I make 15 bucks on that margin, you know, from that pants purchase, well, that's a win. And what we had to offer was, hey, look beyond that first order. Maybe you're spending $20 to acquire that customer, and you're only earning $15 on the first purchase. But heck, if those customers are going to make 10 orders, this is still awesome. In fact, you could spend more, which is kind of this crazy thing to, to, in, in the world of, of customer acquisition, where primarily the name of the game is acquire customers as cheaply as you can. We, we thought, hey, once we have these lifetime value insights, people are going to want to optimize their spending. They're going to think, well, they're going to want to put this long-term value into the, into the optimization uh, equation. But it turned out that there were a few customers of ours, a few retailers were doing that, kind of figuring out, you know, connecting all the dots. But we realized there were a lot of missing pieces. And this is the kind of thing I'm talking about in terms of uh, the algorithm and the insight is really only half the battle. Knowing is half the battle, I guess you could say. Um, it, for, for the online acquisition, if we use the example of just even AdWords, it's not enough just to produce this great extract that says, hey, for each keyword, when you acquire new customers through those search keywords, here's the LTV, the lifetime value. You know, go to town, marketers. 
because there's more that leads to a decision on where you should potentially maybe spend a little more and, and, and still make out really well, or maybe you should cut spending. You know, there's more to it than just looking at the LTV insight. You obviously, in hindsight, need to look at, well, how much are you spending on customers? Right? It's, it's not just about LTV, lifetime value. It's about the lifetime value minus the cost you're spending to acquire the customer. It's kind of that delta. That's how businesses grow. And so that was kind of an obvious step one. But then we realized these other things. Like we'd find this keyword where the ROI was 5,000 to one. And we'd be like, oh my god, we're going to make you a billion dollars. And then they'd realize it was some zany long-term keyword with a typo. And they're not about to pour all this money into that because you know, it's going you know, to acquire one customer no matter what. It, you know, there's not enough volume in these things. And finally, we, we came to realize another kind of obvious thing where we said, hey, pants. You know, pants buyers, they buy five times. Double down on pants. You, could, you can spend more on, on all of those pants keywords. And then we heard back, well, you know what? We're already in the number one search position on Google when you get to pants. So I can spend more, and I'm going to end up in the same spot. And actually, I'm not going to spend more because Google has the auction worked out in a clever way. And, and so it wasn't really an opportunity. And so it wasn't until, and you know, some of these things aren't really the data science side of it, but it wasn't until we layered this predictive insight, the CLV, along with the other data points that were needed. And it was only at that point that we started being able to pull together these things and get to the point, uh, we sometimes use the phrase, in this, you know, the dashboard, the insight's never enough. You need to get either to the decision or you need to get to the doing of the thing. Here it was the, the decision. In order to make a decision that, hey, this channel is awesome, you really had to layer in these other data points along with the, uh, that lifetime value insight. And that's when decisions were made. And that's when we really started seeing a lot of brands get a lot of value out of it. So nowadays, um, it's, it's great. We have a, a, a variety of brands who use that, that general mentality of, hey, let's line up cost per acquisition, CPA, versus the predicted lifetime value, CLV and pull all these data points together to rapidly evaluate what we're doing. And it's the other thing we've realized is it's not like we're the magic elixir that's going to make these brands tons of money. I bring up the Bonobos case here because Bonobos is filled with very smart marketers who have awesome hypotheses and things that we would never think of. And what our platform does is enable them to test things faster. And so by having this predictive analytics, because that's what predictive analytics is for, is for agility. We're enabling, we're, enab we're, we're measuring faster, we're predicting faster so they can make faster decisions and eventually find a place where they're able to do things like increase their customer lifetime value substantially. So we're, we're a small part of the equation, but we lend a helping hand. So one other example to kind of uh, show, you know, that time was about making decisions. Another key insight with Castora that we were really jazzed about in the early days is churn detection. And in the world of retail, this concept of churn is really fuzzy. So Netflix knows when their customers quit, you know, because you actually cancel. But a retailer, you know, your big retail brand, Amazon or something, and, and, and you had this customer who was ordering a lot and they haven't in a couple months. Maybe they're on vacation. Uh, maybe they just also started shopping elsewhere, but they're still going to buy a little bit from you. Uh, who knows? You know, they, they, they moved out of the country. There, there's so many things that it's, it's very hard to have a 100% deterministic uh, kind of mode here in our, in our minds that says, this customer is gone. But what you can do is leverage probability modeling. What you can do is say, hey, a customer that kind of looked like this, that had this pattern, that ordered with this frequency, that bought this kind of stuff, if they go quiet for four or five months, 80% of the time, they never return. And so we had these great models with all these retailers who we know don't really have an idea of what churn means. You all might get those emails after you don't buy at a store for like 60 or 90 days. And like, oh, we miss you. And you're like, well, I don't know why. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm here. I just, I just bought something 60 days ago. It's, you know. Um, so so we have, we have this, this, this models that can distinguish between those shoppers. So Corey, who buys once a year, is not going to get a we miss you email in concept after 60 days. Uh, but if you actually were buying every week, maybe you will. You know, there's a big thing here with timing. And so we take in this data again, you know, the, the order history data. Are you clicking on emails? Are you clicking on the website? All of these things can lead to these insights about uh, who's at risk for, for leaving. But yet again, you know, what we thought right out of the box was cool. So we have this list. 
Uh, we have the, 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 this churn detection, then suddenly email marketers are wanna, gonna wanna gobble it, take it, and, and they're gonna know exactly what to do with it. They're gonna take it and they're gonna test different strategies on how to engage users in these states, and they're gonna put together smart win-back campaigns, and that's gonna help improve customer retention because everybody wants to help improve, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a big, you know, big potential value if you can plug the leaky bucket, you know, and of, of customers who are fading away from your brand. But another type of thing where we realized, huh, you know, the customers who were doing this, some of them were taking the list out of Castora of here are your great customers who are fading away this week. And they were launching these campaigns and they kept coming to us and, and asking for those lists and that was exciting. But a lot of customers weren't. And we were, we, were, we were very confused about that. But we came to find out that, you know, there was a lot of friction points because they had to extract the list from Castora. And then... Uh, you know, they had to go get it into their email provider. And sometimes that was a little bit of a pain. You know, so maybe someone else controls the email provider list, and that's kind of, kind of annoying. And then they need to run a test. Um, and that means they got to go to the creative team, and they got to get a couple creatives. And then after those emails go out, you know, they're trying a free shipping offer versus a 10% off offer uh, to this list who is at risk. Well, now I got to send it to my analytics team, because our analytics team's got to analyze those results and tell me what works. And oh, by the way, I don't just want to look at you know, number of orders. We're doing offers here. So we really have to think about were the offers too steep or too small? And, and did we get incremental orders? And I, of course, only want to make decisions that are statistically significant. I, I shouldn't say that because very few marketers are, are necessarily thinking of that, even though we would wish that they would. Um, but, but all of these things for us, and, and the noble effort to lead them towards better win-back programs that work, uh, that, that's what we want to lead them towards. And that, you know, you get through these steps of getting the list there, getting the creatives, running the stats, and now a month has passed. Five weeks have passed. And so suddenly, like, you know, there, there's all this friction, and, and no one's going to really put a lot of effort behind that in the beginning if it's, you know, they're not going to see the dividends for five, six weeks. And so what we did was we built out integrations. So we talked before about decisions, pulling together different data points. Here it's about systems communicating with each other. So all ESPs have APIs, email service providers, sorry, have APIs because they want you to figure out and trigger all kinds of interesting emails for, for many different reasons. So we said, you know, maybe we can do a little bit better. Maybe we can automatically upload that list into the email service provider. Maybe we can automatically separate if the user tells us, hey, we want to test these two offers. We can build software that allows them to input that, that separates them out, that creates a control group and then we can communicate with the email service provider. In fact, maybe we can even uh, help them and, and point to the, the creatives that are already there set up on the site or we can store them and kind of copy them over to the email service provider. We went through all of those little points of friction and figured out that there was something we could do with software to, to ease that friction and to make these things flow. And so now, we have the A-B testing software built in. We have integration with uh, almost all of the major email providers. And we get to the point where when these customers are able, it's not just, hey, we have this insight of churn detection. Now the, the, the mind space is, how do you want to interact with customers who are fading away? And the marketers tried something. And next week, they get some results. And so the, rather than dealing with this five-week process, of which very few of our customers were leveraging, now uh, the vast majority of our customers who come on, this is one of the first things they put on. And it's the, the churn detection algorithm. I'm sure it's gotten better. You know, we keep improving that. But the big difference has been our emphasis on what to do after the algorithm and after the insights. So in the, in the beginning of, uh, oh, yes, and of course, uh, you know, when we're seeing it work. Yeah. You know. That's cool. Um, uh, but it makes a big difference. I think, again, one of, the, one of the benefits here is agility. This time, the agility is not, oh, I'm predicting LTV. You have the predictive algorithms near and dear to our heart, of course, to say who's going to return and who's not. And that's a, a phenomenal, uh, we see phenomenal improvements with response rate just due to that. But then there's that agility of enabling the team to run tests, again, relying on marketers to, to be clever and, and knowing their customers better to try these different ideas on how to engage with different customers, where the technology, we view it more now as, hey, we're going to surface these insights, and then we're going to enable you to run, your oper to run your, your, uh, the operations that you need to run around these insights to, to find those lists. Um, so in the beginning of the deck, we said, will it blend, meaning, hey, can we find ways to distill this stuff down? Um, you know, we're trying to mix data from all of these different places, and is there a way to do that to, 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 to make the great tasting uh, smoothie that you think is so, so tasty? And in that, of course, you need to filter it down, you know, the signal through the noise. Big data is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the groundwork, but we need to find the kernels of insight within that data. Um, 
But then what we learned was it's not just generating those insights. It's that next piece of are people going to use this thing and what do you have to do to get it into their hands um, that we truly believe that the future, and I think it, it, it's pretty consistent with v, what Vijay said um, at the end of his deck earlier, is it's not just about the analytics. It's about finding ways to get it into uh, to, to action. And um, in some ways, that's the most challenging part. So that's it. Yeah. So we have time for one question. Well, we've already covered this part. Let's do You'll do the next one. Hi, Jonathan Taku from Intent Media. Uh, we're in a similar space of uh, predictive analytics for commerce customers. I'm curious, what you sh showed in terms of this churn analysis is very interesting uh, and how you actually have to say, hey, here are the actions that the marketers are going to be able to take and the marketers know the different types of offers. But what gets actually very interesting from a predictive analytics perspective is uplift modeling. Can you, instead of just identifying who is going to churn, can you identify who is going to react to a given offer? Now, the offers are perhaps seasonal and perhaps specific to the industry, so there are a lot of challenges there. Is that something, and the predictive side is very hard, but uh, is that something that you're striving towards that you've um, already uh, worked on? Yeah, so response modeling is definitely in that realm of predictive analytics and something we look at quite a bit, not just in the context of, of, uh, of customers who are churning, but uh, people who have bought certain things might have a propensity to also buy other things. Um, and perhaps you've also realized that people who buy certain types of products tend to do it more frequently, and so you have this desire to perhaps uh, make customers who are not buying those great frequent uh, items aware of those items because if you can get them on that, it might end up driving a ton of value, uh, kind of extending the lifetime value quite a bit. So it's all, uh, it's definitely all within this, this wheelhouse. Um, you know, we do some of that uh, we already is built into the software a little bit in terms of tracking the responses of individual customers and keeping that single view of customer, to use another trite uh, buzzwordy thing. Um, where you realize that some customers are more likely to respond to certain things than others. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, ultimately, if you were purely in this data world, the, the other little bit of a challenge there is different organizations have a different appetite um, in terms of how black box they want a solution to be. If you were totally going to draw, uh, write up a, a solution that's like total software simulation and everything, I think that's the ultimate thing you're going for is responses. And so you could build a, a whole predictive engine off of just figuring out what, is, you know, what are the actions for different users that are likely to get certain responses and predicting that. But um, there's also something, and I wouldn't even criticize it necessarily because there's something very uh, helpful about having marketers in the mix there where they say, well, you know what, you, you know, that, that model will never realize necessarily, well, maybe we should try a funny email. Or maybe we should try this type of communication because these types of customers, I kind of know that they're, they have a little bit of a zany personality. And so it, there's a little bit of, of uh, I think, a balance of needing to do the response modeling, like you're saying, but also allow people to kind of just come in and try new ideas that you might not have any predictive assessment for yet, um, and then you develop them over time. That was kind of a wishy-washy answer, I guess, but it's an interesting topic. That's fine. You can settle that over wine yeah. after this. Great. Thank you so much, Corey. Yeah, thanks.